Wow. All right. Less, less technical problems today, which is great. Uh, hey, everybody. Everyone's in a hot place right now, <laughs> apparently. Uh, yeah, it's pretty hot, and even in Portland, Oregon, it's going to be like 100 degrees today, which I am not looking forward to at all. This time I uh, decided to be smart and not use entire 18 by 24 sheets of paper because it's unwieldy when I'm trying to swap out paper. And so I'm using some ones cut in half because you can't see all of it anyway. Hey Mary. I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes for people to arrive. Hope everyone's doing great today. Hey Karen. Where's everybody from? Where's everybody coming from? Sunny in the Colorado mountains? Eugene, Oregon, nice. Hey, Olivia. Berlin, that's awesome. What's it like in Berlin right now? UK, London, very cool. Miserable Spice. Is that like one of the Spice Girls? Your Miserable Spice? Baltimore? South Africa? Wow. Brooklyn. More UK folks. Portland, Maine. Hey, Beth. From your sister city over here in Portland, Oregon. The Netherlands. East Texas. All over the place. <clears throat> yeah, Oregon seeing 100 degree heat. This usually happens like once or every like two weeks out of the summer, but it happens normally in June. For some reason it's happening in August this time. Is it boiling hot in SF Bay Area? I feel like that's so rare. I used to live in San Francisco. Never really got like above 80 from what I remember. But that was a that was a decade ago. Miami, LA, Bangor, Maine. All right, I'm gonna give it another minute and then we're gonna get into it. Um, I'll do my best to pay attention to chat. I've got it in front of me. And um, I've got a couple of things that some folks wanted me to cover um, today. Well, one thing I wanted to cover was drawing a three quarter view of the eyes because I didn't demo that in the lesson. So I thought it might be good to at least demo that. Uh, another thing that folks wanted to see was um, the pro profile view um, from scratch of the nose. So I thought I'd do that as well. Sheila, you might want to try restarting. You can't hear me. Uh, <laughs> everyone can hear me, right? Because you're all responding to me. Okay, Sheila's good. Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. We got about an hour today. I want to spend a half hour, if it's necessary, on the three quarter view of the eyes. Um, and then we'll move on to the nose. And then if you have other questions, um, we can talk about those. Uh, I think the Sketchy Crew is going to be posting a supplemental video that I did uh, this week based on how to put the center line on the face, specifically in like a three-quarter view or any view that isn't frontal or profile. Um, I've got a tip for that. I can kind of show you today too, but it can help you get the placement right. Porcupine Pancake, that is a great username. All right, let's go. So uh, let's do this live stream. There we go. How to draw and place the eyes on the head in three quarter view. Again, this wasn't requested, but I thought it'd be good to at least show. Um, let's see how big my hand is here. Okay, let's try this. We might need to adjust the exposure a little bit. So as always, circles. I hope, I've been really happy to see, I might need to stop down a second, or a stop. I've been really happy to see folks uh, drawing lots of circles. Um, hopefully you're getting better at them. Hope you're drawing big ones. Yeah, I really encourage everyone to draw big because um, it 
can get kind of tight when you're when you're drawing really small in like a small sketchbook. So maybe try to go bigger if you can, if you're not already. A little shaky this morning. We did warm up, but I find that after having coffee, uh, you get a little shaky. So let's see how I do. All right, so the first thing that we always do after we draw our sphere is we do our equator line. So I'm gonna do my best here to draw it across. Um, there might be a little distortion in this photo, uh, which happens obviously with a lot of camera photos. So we're gonna kind of undistort that mentally. We're not going for a likeness here. We're just gonna be doing um, our best to, to kind of put some eyes on the face. Again, this is just a demo to show you how to do this. And so you have an image to kind of match up with it. Oh yeah, I still need to do the pencil sharpening demo. Um, it just, it's gonna be me watching me doing the same thing for 15 minutes, which is fine. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll need to do that. I, was, I think it's on my to-do list today. I'm sorry I haven't gotten that to you. So I'm just kind of looking at the model to kind of get a sense of what the angle of the side plane needs to be. For that ellipse, it's probably about right. We'll make it work within this perspective, whatever this ends up being. Um, and now we want to go ahead and create a vertical, vertical line, which kind of shows the orientation of tilt for the head. Um, so we've got that. And now we're going, let me show you really quick how we can figure out where the center line of the head is supposed to be. So um, <clears throat> this ellipse, what we want to try to do is kind of replicate it. It's like scale it up so that it hits the very top, very bottom of this. So I'm going to go ahead and try to do that really lightly to the best of my ability. Just kind of eyeballing it. Try not to go too dark on the left side because we're going to erase that. So all I've done is replicated the ellipse and scaled it up. Can you see that? And then if we erase, 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 we get where the center line is. So that's the that's the trick. <laughs> it can just help you do that if you can't eyeball it, and it's pretty. It'll be pretty accurate. It'll always be in the exact center of the head. So try that out. Did I decide on the? Let's start doing this. Did I decide on the side plane shape by the corner of the eye? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I was kind of looking at this um, sort of where the the plane of the head kind of changes over from the front to the side trying to hit somewhere around there, maybe a little bit shy of that. But yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of how I did it. How do I determine how big the ellipse should be? Um, I've got in the class uh, a measurement, but it's usually approximately between two thirds of the size of the head, or the height of the head, and three quarters. So this one's about three quarters, the height of the head. So now we're gonna do the hairline. And you can't see her hairline, but we do know that it's, from this perspective, about a, um, 45 degree angle and then wraps around the head. Now hers might be a little squatter. Everyone's face is different so these measurements are not going to be perfect. Um, well my measurements will be perfect. No, <laughs> they'll be perfect in relation to each other uh, which is the most important part. Just trying to see if I want to Pull her hairline down just a smidge. Just a smidge. It's kind of funny how really, really subtle, minor, seemingly minor changes in, the, in these like measurements will drastically affect uh, sort of the outcome. Someone asked today in the comments where the hairline is um, 
generally speaking, like how do you know where to place it? You kind of have to guess to some degree. You look at the model, but sometimes usually it hits right about where um, the side plane is or a little bit above it, depending upon how big you made uh, the side plane. I'm okay with people eyeballing it too. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's observation. That's what we need to be looking at. Um, you're going to eyeball it in the sense that like, you're going to kind of interpret whether or not the, for this individual, the hairline is taller or shorter. But these are just general measurements that we're trying to follow. Okay, so I'm taking my measurements and I'm making sure they're pretty good. These are pretty good. Chin's maybe a little bit low, like just a hair. This is the most important step. So you want to kind of be as accurate as you can. I do notice that her face does, um, doesn't quite do the full, like, uh, straight plane down her chin. She doesn't have a very pronounced chin in terms of it being forward. So we're going to see a little bit more curvature back, but again, we're not going to really be paying attention to too much of that. The hairline um, beta does determine the size of everything else. That is, that is absolutely correct. So if your hairline is shorter, then these measurements will be shorter and then the face will be shorter. So we've got our measurements for our brow line, our hairline, nose, bottom of the nose, bottom of the chin. So let's just kind of create that rhythm line that gets us uh, where the side plane, where the plane of the uh, front plane of the face and the side plane of the face start to turn. And this is just an approximation. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of drop a jawline down. And we're not getting into, you know, how to change this method or alter the method along the way to get a likeness. Um, that happens in the last week of the class. So we're, we're just really doing these sort of like ideal measurements and such. Okay. So the first thing that I like to start with is... <clears throat> um, this little keystone shape, which is the glabella. Seeing a little bit of foreshortening, so we're going to see these angles kind of impose each other a little bit more drastically. So that's the area right here that kind of starts to come back in toward your skull. Jana asks, or Jana, 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 when someone has a receding hairline, do I use that for the hairline or use um, where it would be if it wasn't receding? I'd use where it would be if it wasn't receding. Because like even people with a very short hairline, like some, especially men, um, some men have like a really small forehead. Um, just because of the nature of their hair. So the hairline is like, it's just a shorthand term for something that's about up here. Like my hairlines, I have a pretty tall forehead. Uh, so I think that if I took this measurement like all the way up to my hair, it would probably be a little bit long. Okay, so now we're gonna create our abstraction here. Um, I'm gonna look at the angle of her nose and try to replicate that. Normally I'd have my uh, my support up taller because it's hard to like translate an angle when I hold my arm out and it's at an angle to bring it straight down because my hand hits the um, 
my hand hits the desk. So I can't really, I have to kind of, this is where I have to eyeball and kind of remember what that angle is. Not perfect, but it's okay. Then we'll create that general abstraction. One thing I want to note is that um, when I'm thinking about all of these different lines, I'm thinking about them all running in parallel to each other. I'm starting to notice in the class that some people, their features kind of start to look a little bit weird because the, the lines of the face when they're drawing them aren't parallel and it's really important that they stay parallel to each other like these specifically these key landmarks because then otherwise your features start shifting in weird ways how to estimate the different angles of the glabella um, just look at the model. Uh, you can see that her, this angle is approximately where, if I'm looking at her, the eyebrow on the right, <laughs> you can kind of start to see how it curves in toward the nasal bone and then comes back out. So that's what you want to look at. Usually, and you can see sort of like where it is and this is in relation to um, the the left eyebrow if you're looking at her. Um, you can sort of start to see uh, where those angles uh, are. So it's less an estimate as opposed to like actually just observing. How do I decide the measurement of the keystone? Honestly, I'm just kind of roughing it in. I actually stand to make this a little bit more steep. Um, this starts to get into a question of like, when do you, um, use these like very sort of generalized measurements versus um, actually looking at the model. And so right now we're just using these for basic placement. Um, if I were to take a, be taking a much longer effort here, I would be measuring along with it to get relationships so that I could correct these things along the way. So the shorter answer is um, in doing this demo, I'm gonna eyeball it and just hope I get something close in, um, in real life, I would kind of eyeball it and then correct along the way. Okay. So we've got our rough in of our nose. Um, we can go ahead and complete the nose if we want, or we can just go into the eyes. So let's just go into the eyes. I'm just gonna kind of create the eye brow and see hers wrap up around the brow bone. I'm not going into as, as deep um, an explanation as I do into in the, uh, the lesson videos. So, but I just, I'm drawing the eyebrows now. Again, keeping things pretty parallel if possible. That way they look like they line up. In this particular case, it's like things are skewed and then things start to get skewed as you go down the face. And again, I think that that's because of the distortion of the, uh, the camera. Is it okay to put some perspective in the parallel lines? Absolutely, Richard. It is totally okay to do that. Um, I think it's, I'm trying to, in this, in this class, um, the overall class, try to avoid perspective because that's a whole other that's a whole other topic and can kind of um, trip people up. So we've got our nose really loosely um, kind of roughed in here. And I'm, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to try to start to find um, the inner corner of the eye. And I'm looking at the outside of her nose and I'm looking at where that hits. And it's not quite a vertical line, but it's relatively vertical. It's not as steep as the nose itself. And what that's going to do is it's going to represent um, one part of the inner corner of the eye. 
how do I know how far to project the nose? Is it just looking at the model or a measurement? Um, it is looking at the angle of the bridge of the nose and then looking at how much of the bottom you can see. So like in reality, this is kind of the frontal plane of the nose. So I'm drawing the abstraction here, but like um, I'd probably bring the ball down a little bit more, let, that's, let, let this be the front plane of the nose and then let all of this be the top plane as you get into the bridge. So really it's this angle that's gonna dictate how far. And we would end up adding some significant cheek over here. Okay, so we've got one part. Uh, the next part is figuring out where the eye sits, uh, where that inner corner of the eye sits. And usually it's in looking at her head especially. It is right in the middle of the head. So I'm gonna try to find a measurement that is right in the middle of the head. This usually takes a few attempts. And I'm just sliding my finger I'm looking at this, you're seeing the top of my head a little bit, but um, I'm sliding my finger down here to try to put my fingernail on it to see if I can find a mark. And then I'm moving the tip of my pencil to that spot. I have to remember where it was, but I'm moving the tip of my pencil down to that spot. And then I'm looking at where my fingernail hits and hopefully it hits the bottom of the chin. So this looks pretty good. Okay. So what we've just found, and again, parallel lines. Just taking this straight across. I wanna make sure my eyes are level with each other, otherwise things can start to look very weird. Unless you're successfully able to replicate this precise distortion, it's gonna look weird. Okay, so one thing I tried doing before we did this, or before I started this lesson, was to see um, how, how big to make this eye. This one can get really tricky um, in three-quarter view because you don't have all the frontal relationships, which is what I showed in the, the class's lesson for this, is the relationships between each eye and then the, like, the width of the eye, the width between the eyes, and the width from the outside of the eyes to the outside of the head. So you don't really have that here. Um, so you have to kind of, you have to use relationships of key landmarks. <laughs> this is kind of where it gets kind of weird. You have to use relationships of key landmarks to kind of find a measurement that kind of fits. And so um, I've tried printing these out and I didn't have printer paper before this, so I apologize. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take this measurement so it's kind of the outside of the brow bone to the middle. I'm going to take that measurement on the model. And I'm going to measure that from the outside of the far eye. So what I'm seeing is that <clears throat> where her makeup, she's got like a little cattail, um, kind of sits is somewhere around out here. And um, this distance, if I scooch it down, bring it over to this distance, is approximately the center of her iris looking over. So I know that there's some sort of eye over here. Now, the inner corner of her eye, I've said before, um, generally speaking, they, they sit a little bit below the center of the eye, um, and you can see that with her eye. Uh, can I size in relation to the eyebrow? You can size in relation to anything. Like I'm sure that my eyebrow isn't isn't quite perfect here. So it's it's um, things that you can be sure of are things like the center of the head to the outer brow. Um, you can be sure of the bottom of the nose to here. So you kind of want to take measurements that um, 
that you know are sort of right uh, or as right as they can be, whereas this eyebrow is probably could be out a little bit further, it could be a little bit shorter. When I'm drawing a live model, how long does it take you to place measurements? They seem to take me forever. Well, I think that's why um, this method is really important to sort of learn and internalize because the whole goal of it is to help you get to things a lot faster. Um, so you're not spending a lot of time doing basic measurements. Um, but I think that it's all sort of practice at the end of the day. So now I'm going to think about, we're just going to draw an eye. Um, and like I said, this is the outer part of her makeup. And so I know that the eye comes in from that. I'm kind of doing an approximation here as well. Might even come in a little bit more. Like I said, this is the hardest one. And if I were to spend some time on this, um, I would be doing another set of measurements. Like I can probably say that that measurement to this, to the center of her eye, let's see if we can do a general. It's about half the distance. So yeah, that's probably about right. Also, by the way, Naomi, I haven't drawn a live model in way too long. So anyway, okay, so let's, we know that this is the tear duct, the inner corner of the eye. So we're gonna go up a little bit higher. I can see that the outer corner of her eye is a little bit higher. Um, I'm not gonna try to draw the eyelids. It's really funny, like trying to draw that depth in the eyelids gets really hard, especially at like a size like this. If I were to scale this up twice, like to two times the size of this, it's a lot easier because you've got more room, but because we're drawing so small, small it gets really hard. And I said that in the lesson video. Um, but in a normal sense, if you're actually rendering this thing, you would indicate that through lights and darks because usually if it's overhead lit, you would see the bottom eyelid, the top of the bottom eyelid, because it would be lighter, and then the area below it would be darker because less light is hitting that. And the inverse is true for the top eyelid. So usually that's how you convey it. We're trying to convey it with line, which is not a very good way of conveying it. The reason why we're doing line, by the way, in these lessons is because <clears throat> I think that you really need to understand the underlying shape and forms as described by lines, being able to describe three dimensions using lines. Um, is more is important so that you can understand the forms so that then you can go in and know how to cast light on those forms and understand how they move around the forms. So you have to understand the forms first before you can understand how the light works on it. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Okay, so I'm going to start and I'm totally looking at her eye here. And I can see that we've got sort of a long one, a long line up here starts to curve back around and kind of create a shelf up here and then we get it turning back down toward the tear duct and i think i made that a little too severe So I'm just going to adjust. In my mind, in my opinion, the eyes are probably the hardest thing to draw. Especially this part. I'm still not great at doing irises. It's very difficult for me to kind of get these ellipses in here correctly. Didn't quite hit our center measurement there, but we'll just keep moving forward because I want to make sure that we get, get to the nose. So now I'm also thinking about how it wraps around the bottom of the eyeball. And I'm thinking about how it starts to come back. And then in here, we start to see things like um, the edges of the eyes, they start to 
kind of come in because there is a sphere, there is an eyeball in there. And I'd probably even say that like, this is not as tall. And then I want to get that crease of the eyelid, which looks like it gets thicker up here, and then it curves around, so we start to see less of it, and then it tucks in. I know that's a little bit difficult to see. I apologize. Let's try that again. Uh, Tammy, you said, uh, so make the iris eyeball first. I mean, that's a way to do it for sure. I don't, you don't have to by any means. I don't think there's like a sort of correct step here. Then I'm going to think about this bottom of the eyelid and just give it some dimension because I can see. I can see it. I'm over exaggerating this right now just so you can see it a little bit better. But, And this is where you would see the top of the bottom eyelid here. Again, it's just really difficult to kind of draw it in this, um, this small space. Feel like I'm making excuses. <clears throat> All right, so, and then this is where you'd see her cattail or whatever the design of this eye makeup is, which is pretty cool, right? You'd see something like that. So that's one, the point of this is really just to show that like the iris, because it's turned away from you, is pushing the lids of the eyeball, um, or the lids of the eye up and out um, towards where it's at its thickest part, where the eye iris is at its thickest part. So it's actually distorting um, the eyelids. And if we were to look across and think, okay, this is also where our tear duct is, we would now start from there and try to keep the heights of the eye, the eyes the same. Again, because if you keep them everything parallel, things um, start to feel correct. Uh, Lizanne says, in inches, what would I, what would the ideal size to work on when you're a beginner? Sorry for your English. No, your English is perfectly fine. What size would I work on to begin with? Um, I would work on something like uh, 18 by 24 inches, like big, just so you have room if you can, but at the very least uh, 11 by 17. Um, Porcupine asks, do I usually draw much larger? Uh, I think that when I'm trying to do a proper like a, if I would to do more formal, like atelier style head, I would want to draw much larger. Um, I would want to do 18 by 24 so I could get all of those measurements right. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do again, kind of exactly the same thing. I'm literally just looking at the eye and knowing in this case that the eyeball is somewhere around here and that this eyelid is coming up and is going to curve around that eyeball. Just trying to keep in mind that, that Pac-Man shape. Now the reason why I'm drawing like this right now with my hand like this, which is what I said not to do, <laughs> is because I am working so small. It's very difficult to get these kinds of angles working from your full arm. And I'm going to try to match the iris that I'm seeing 
on the left one. This is tricky because it's it's like it's a little bit of an ellipse. I mean, it is an ellipse. It's just um, so subtle that it's difficult to get. Correct. And it's easy to make really small mistakes, and then you have to get in there and try to erase them, and they're a pain. And then we can actually see the outer, uh, the bottom eyelid also again come around, wrap around, and then come back up. I'd almost say that this is sort of a conceptual demo, just because I'm kind of trying to exaggerate some of these ideas so that you can see them a little bit easier. And then we actually end up seeing the outer part of her cheekbone going into the um, area where the, the eye starts to sit in. And I'd want to take this in a little bit, I think. I'm better at this kind of drawing, not with this pencil, actually, uh, when doing my sketchbook, just because uh, I feel like I can get more precision. This pencil, in my mind, isn't really great for this kind of like detail work. All right, I'm going to look up. <clears throat> Uh, the ellipse of the iris is in the same uh, as the side of the head. Uh, no. Uh, the ellipse of the iris is just depending upon where they're looking. So it can be anywhere. Um, when you said that after drawing the side ellipse, you put in the center line. Let's put this on screen. When you said that after drawing the side of the ellipse, you put in the center line, which is always exactly in the center of the remaining section. Is that true for all views that aren't fully frontal view? When you said that after drawing the side ellipse, you put in the center line, is that true for all views? Yes, I would say that there's just sort of an order of operations. You don't have to. You don't have to put the center line in after this, but it's really this ellipse that curve that determines what that top of the curve is going to be over here. So in my mind, it's a heck of a lot easier to get this side ellipse uh, first. Um, it should just be like circle, side ellipse. Those are the things you need to understand for um, the orientation. So um, yeah, this is, this is pretty much it. It's a, it's a lot of observation, but it's a lot of knowing that um, this doesn't look good at all. <laughs> it's a lot of observation, but it's really just knowing like that these two eye widths kind of aren't the same, aren't the same width. It can be difficult to kind of get this one to be the right size. Um, you just need to know that the lids are dimensional and that they really do wrap around the eyeball uh, and um, that the irises um, push. It's not the irises, I'm sorry. Everything's kind of like not in my head today, I apologize, but this, we'll just say the center of the eye um, is, there is a lens that covers it, and so it pushes out the eyes uh, wherever they are. All right, I need to move on, 940, I need to move on to the nose. So I'm gonna move on to the nose. I'm gonna try not to tear the heck out of this paper. Hey, Matthew Ward, my coworker. One of my coworkers just showed up in chat. Ah, just in time to see me draw another nose. Um, just wanna make sure we're good. Let's zoom out a little bit. 
Let's see where we're at. Just trying to find the placement of my hands. What pencil would I use? Apologize if you're asking too many questions. No pancake, you're not asking too many questions. Um, what pencil would I use if I was drawing that small? I would use um, a more traditional, like, uh, you know, just graphite pencil. It's just a lot easier to manipulate in my mind because, like, that thing has a pencil lead that's incredibly, incredibly sharp and long, and it's you can't get down here to get the articulation you need. It's very difficult to get the articulation you need when you're up here with something that's this sharp. Um, that's why it's best suited for drawing with your whole arm. Forgive me while I throw down another sheet of paper. Yeah, it is fun to see these uh, the portraits come together once you start with the features. I, I admire folks for like continuing on past the nose and eyes, past the lessons that have been kind of taught in the class uh, for going for it. But it's funny, it's, it's like, and this is not a knock on them, but like that's about when things start to fall apart with the mouth kind of being in a weird place and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, so I think once we get to those lessons this week, it'll be a little bit easier. Okay, uh, how to draw and place the eyes on the head. Nope, that's not right. That shouldn't say that, y'all. I apologize. Just ignore that. <laughs> ignore that thing at, up at the top. Uh, we're doing the side, the profile of the nose. Um, so we're gonna do the profile of the nose. So uh, let's zoom out a little bit here just so we can start to see. So we always start with a circle. You know what, I might actually erase that and go a little bit bigger. So does the center line always divide the remaining section into two equal parts? No, it does not. It always, um, especially in three-quarter view, changes it. At the beginning of this video, if you go back to the beginning of this video, once, it's, once the live stream is done, you'll see how I generate this, the center line, or how you can generate the center line um, in a three-quarter view. Uh, and it is based on the side plane in terms of generating the ellipse. And you'll see that when you when you do the, that technique and you see the new center line or the center line that's created, that it does not divide the area between the edge of the sphere and what was the side plane into equal, visually equal parts. It does, one side does get smaller. Mm, good enough. That's a good enough circle. Okay, where are we at? 944. This one's gonna be quick. All right, Dylan Sara has entered the house. Yes, you know, but I mean after the side plane are the two remaining sections always equal? I'm not sure what you mean by the two remaining sections. So the first thing I want to do here is create an equator line. It's not, I always have a hard time with this because I keep scooching over for no good reason. Porcupine asks if I'm part of the inking classes that are coming up. Are you talking about our Inktober? I'm thinking about doing Inktober. I'm working on a new class right now, so we'll see. I might be worn out because I'm going to have to make sure that I tend to my uh, the community that participates in the other class. All right, so we just did our side plane. It's this horizontal line is not high enough, so I'm going to correct that.
Can I just tell you, Anish, what I'm using? Not sure what that's in reference view. Reference to, reference view, what am I doing? What am I talking about? Okay, so I'm gonna move through this relatively quickly. So the first thing that we want to do here is try to, well first, let's just create our vertical line for orientation. And then we're gonna create that hairline, which is gonna hit roughly at about 45 degrees here, just above or right at that side plane. Let's come down, we'll create our initial measurements here. So we've got our hairline to brow line, and then we're gonna do the bottom of the nose. Then we're gonna come down one more time to the bottom of the chin. So what I wanna show you with this one is just like how you can think about um, sort of the minor planes of the nose uh, in terms of where and how they get positioned. Um, but it's all the same concepts as the front and the three quarter. All right, so I'm gonna drop my, the front of my face, the line that comes down from the front of my face. Let's go ahead and now we'll start zooming in a little bit. Okay, and this should be vertical if at all possible. Uh, the new class I'm working on is going to be about um, a mark making technique that I do a lot, so contour hatching. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I wasn't sure what, what it was in reference to, what, it, what he was asking for. Um, okay, so I'm going to drop the jawline really quick. Again, not her jawline, but a jawline. And so now we can just go right into the nose. Um, at this point. So we have kind of everything we need. If we wanted to, we could create a rhythm line here, which is what I always recommend, but for this particular moment, we don't need to do that. I'm going to kind of clarify some of this by getting some of those initial preliminary lines out of the way. Um, we know that like the ear would come over here too, uh, or we will know that <laughs> this week. All right, so let's start with, we always started with the keystone shape, right? Um, when we were doing three-quarter view and frontal view. So we kind of do the same thing here. So I'm just going to take, um, take from the brow line and bring it down a little bit. Now if we look at hers, she's actually got a nasal bone that is protruding a lot more. So she doesn't have like this indented, can you see it on my face? This indented um, sort of where the glabella kind of comes in. Hers goes kind of straight down. Um, but we're going to do this just less to, to reference her and more to just reference the idea that like on a kind of general person, if we look at the skull, we can see that, let's do it this way since, oh no, the jaw's gone. Okay, we're good now. Um, if, we, if we look at this, ugh, we can see that the brow line happens, the brow ridge happens, and then it comes down, right? Before it hits, before it hits the nasal bone. So that's what we're kind of emulating here. And so we're gonna be drawing. All right, so it comes down and then we're gonna see where the nasal bone comes out. And if I were to draw a skull, I would just stop here and then you would see the, the nasal bone of the skull, but we're not doing that. And um, we come out and we just, we're creating that same abstraction. That might be a little, a little long. We're gonna create that same abstraction of just bringing the nose out we're gonna see a little bit of the sort of ball from the side, and then we're gonna see the nose come in. This area right here, the nose would probably hit a little bit out, and that's because we have a thing called a tooth cylinder here. We're gonna learn about this this week, the mouth and how it causes um, this part of your face to protrude. You can see it even in this skull where it starts to kind of protrude out up in here, comes back in and then pushes back out. So it changes a little bit from person to person, but generally speaking, we're gonna see something like this and then we'll see it kind of come out over here. All right, so that's, that's the, um, go ahead and take this up. That's the nose. This is supposed to be the top plane. I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit. 
top plane of the nose, side plane of the nose. So now if we were to try to do um, some of the uh, sort of minor plane abstractions. Now, when I, um, I don't know if you all caught this in the lesson, but when I, when I was um, kind of showing the minor plane abstractions, and I did end up kind of drawing it in the three-quarter view um, just to reinforce them, but the real point of them is just to internalize uh, them in your head. So thinking about the nose in terms of it having a top plane, it having a front plane, curving under for the septum, getting into the wings of the nose and how they have dimension, how they kind of come around, how they have a bottom plane, and how there's a side plane that carries up the full bridge of the nose. So um, a lot of that's just kind of meant to be really internalized so that when you are observing a person, you can start to see things like the front of the plane of the nose, we're gonna draw kind of a squat nose here, which is fine. We're gonna see that um, we have a top plane of the ball of the nose, which is the lower lateral, lateral cartilage. We've got a nasal bone, which kind of comes out, and we'll see it come back in when we get to the upper lateral cartilage. I use all of these terms in the class, so um, you'll be able to reference the sheets uh, the, sorry, the supplemental images in the class. Uh, where can you find a skull like that? Uh, just online, on Amazon. So yeah, that's the front plane of the nose. We start to think about um, how the side plane begins to exist, and in this case we don't have to worry about it because we don't really see it a whole lot. You can see where the nose joins the maxilla over here in this area. We've got the wing of the nose, and we know that it's got a side plane and then a bo bottom plane over here. So side planes up here. And then we'll kind of look at the model a little bit. So that's where the side plane right here starts, and we'll turn under for the bottom plane. We're not going to see as hard a line here. I'm just trying to illustrate it. And we'll see how the nostrils curve in. A lot of this, again, is just, it's internalized. Um, the nose is one of those things where you just have to really think about the minor forms, understand how they curve around so that you can um, understand that there are different kinds of planes and that those planes affect how the different shapes, like the nostril, how it's, you know, if I were to look at it from underneath, it's going to look one way, and then if I tilt my head down, I'm going to see a much shallower version of that. So just trying to really articulate that all these these kinds of features wrap around and under and all of that stuff um, based on those minor planes. So there we've got the septum curving in. It's going to meet the area above the lip. Thinking about the sort of back plane, if you will, of the wing of the nose, and how like this would start to come into the top plane. You can kind of see the side plane. You can kind of see where it would start to turn forward, and you'd see sort of a front plane, which would meet the side plane of this part of the nose. Now, all of that stuff is really meant, um, again, so you can understand how the form turns, because if I were to start rendering this, um, which I, where are we at, 955, I won't be able to really do, but if I said that like, you know, the light was coming kind of straight down, I would know where, this is really hard to do this small, where those because of the planes, I would know where the, the forms start to turn and where those core shadows would be, which is where the light hits the least. And I would probably see some mid-tones in this area where the side of the nose isn't quite getting hit with as much light. And I'd probably see 
a little bit of something like this because this area of the nose is getting a lot more light. So I don't know if you can really see that, but um, that's what the minor planes of the nose are really meant to be able to do is, is they help you create the form, which is hard to see when you're just drawing in 2D, but then they help you kind of think in your head, how is the form um, existing so that you know where the different planes shift so you can light them uh, correctly. Um, is this a three-quarter view? No, this is a profile view. Oh yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot that that's what's on the screen. Um, anyway, so that's that's where and how this stuff uh, this works. And like, if I were to draw an eye, the same measurements uh, come into play here. And we're just about up on time, but I do want to. Dylan, do you have a live stream right after this? I feel like you're gonna, you've got a stream right after this. The one thing I want to say, and I didn't get a chance to really say this, but if I were to say this is where the center of the head is, I don't know if that's right, I'm just taking a rough measurement, and I use that same idea of like a vertical line-ish, a little bit tilted, kind of coming up, which is where the tear duct would hit, you can see that the glabella up here is up above it. And there's no specific um, angle, but like that's how you would still derive the angle, so that you know where kind of the eyeball, generally speaking, would sit. I think this is like a bad example, to be honest with you. But yeah, the, eye, the eyeball would sit somewhere in this area and would have a... eyelid. That kind of comes over it. That's a really bad, fast drawing. Okay, Dylan's got a live stream. It's happening here in two minutes. Um, I just want to say thanks to the sketchy crew. I want to say thanks to everybody that came out today to ask a bunch of questions. Um, hopefully I covered a bunch of stuff that y'all wanted to hear. Um, and Dylan's going to be doing, I'm sure, some stuff with ink, some stuff with ink that he's, uh, he's made himself using natural materials. It's always inspiring to see such beautiful and lovely colors. Um, and he gives you great tips on how to how to make your own inks as well. Um, it's always a really fun, it's always a really fun stream to watch. So I highly recommend you check that out. Um, maybe Sketchy or Dylan, you can post a link to your to your stream coming up here in a second. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I still need to make the pencil sharpening demo. This week we've got the mouth and the ears coming out, which is going to be really fun. Um, and I think that's it. I hope everyone's had a good week. Hope everyone has a good week coming up. Um, I'm gonna be really hot in 100 degree weather in Portland, Oregon. Uh, glad that y'all are finding this helpful. Thank you again for coming out. There's the link for Dylan's broadcast. And um, Don, you found a, ooh, yeah, put that link to the pencil sharpener that sharpens stuff like mine. Um, but yeah, I hope you have a great week. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, those of you that are in the class end up doing with the mouth and with the ears and with all of that, you'll be able to put things together. So um, send more questions my way if you're in the class, post them in the, the activity feed. But other than that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you all for being here. All right. Till next week, Sunday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs>